Curtis Blow. Hey. Welcome to Vlad TV. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Yeah. I mean, we've All actually right. been talking about doing this for a while, ever yes, since sir. we ran into each other at the Don Magic Wand Show. Yes, yes, and, yes. And uh, it's finally come together. Yep, yep. Good to be here. Good to be here, man. Finally, this is where it's all done, folks. Uh, amazing program. Amazing man, Mr. Vlad. Thank you. That, that means <laughs> a lot coming from someone of your uh, stature. No problem. So let's start from the very beginning. You grew up in Harlem. Yes, yes. Actually, uh, born and raised in Harlem. Um, and and it, it's funny you said that because I came up with a new name, a new slogan for myself. And I now call myself, because of LeBron James and the NBA championship and the finals and the whole thing, you know, I am now officially the Harlem Globetrotter. The Harlem Globetrotter. Yes. Love it. Love it. Now, you grew up in the 60s and 70s yes, in Harlem. Yes, yes, yes. You know, these days Harlem is gentrified and there is like Starbucks and everything else like that. But during that time, how was Harlem? Wow, growing, that's a beautiful question because it, it was a glorious time. Uh, mixed feelings and emotions and isms, beliefs going around that time where I mean it was the highlight of the civil rights movement. So you had people like, you know, Martin Luther King, uh, uh, um, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., uh, Malcolm X was, was actually running around the neighborhood where I grew up and that was like the west side of Harlem. We call it the hill between 140th and 146th Street, Sugar Hill, they yeah. call it. That area is where Malcolm X grew up. And, and so I came up in, I mean, all of my heroes were assassinated and murdered and it was um, a, a, a very serious but glorious time uh, where I grew up in the early 60s. And even sports was kind of like traumatic in my household because ever since I was born, my, my, my stepdad loved sports and basketball. He used to always watch basketball. And I remember, you know, just all the profanity of this guy. <laughs> you know, he was just cursing, oh, uh, Bill Russell, oh, I hate you, Bill Russell. And every year in New York, you know, the Knicks would go to the championship and have to play this team, the Boston Celtics. Yeah. From 11 years, the man won every year the championship, 11 rings for Bill Russell. Hmm. I grew up, I was born into that. So he retired in 1968. I was like nine years old. He retired, came back, and I was like, oh my God. He retired, I thought the Knicks were surely gonna win. You know, we had Willis Reed, Walt Frazier, you know, uh, Dave DeBusher, Phil Jackson was on the team, and right. Dick Barnett. And, and so I was like, the Knicks are surely gonna win this year. So here comes Bill Russell comes back out of retirement and he becomes the first player coach mm -hmm. in history of basketball and they won again. So the next year he finally retires and for the first time I get to see the Knicks. I'm 10 years old, 1969. The Knicks won their first championship. Not only the Knicks, but we had Broadway Joe Willie and we had uh, the amazing Mets. So yep. all my teams won in 69. Best year of my life. So when you first were coming up, there was no hip hop. There was no rappers. There was no, you know, hip hop DJs. There were no break dancers. There right. were no, I mean, was there graffiti artists back then? Uh, yes, it, it started to happen around the yeah. early 70s. Right. So coming out of that civil rights movement in the 60s, uh, the music that was very, very uh, relevant, I'd say, during those times was the music of James Brown yeah. and, of course, the Motown sound. So uh, that music was so very special to us. And, and for me, I became, my mom was an avid, sub, she was a music lover and an avid supporter of music. We go out to the record stores and I think before, I, be, I think the first things, the first reading I ever did was to read the charts. You go into a, the neighborhood record store, each record store had their top 10 charts uh -huh. and you would read that she would stay up on the top 10. She'd had to have the top 10 of that week. And so I think I learned how to read by reading those charts and I became her DJ, I guess, <laughs> when I was about six, seven, you know, in 66, 67, around that time. And um, 
My favorite artist during that time was James Brown because of his music and the syncopated beats that that his drummer Clyde uh, uh, would put down and just his whole sound, you know, with the guitar and the wah wah pedal and the the the. Uh, it was different from the Motown sound. The signature, the time signature of the drums for Motown was pla ta ta tum ta tum ta 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 tum ta tum ta. But along came James Brown with this new sound. So this syncopated rhythm just like it, it, it changed the face of music, but it blew my mind. And yeah. I became uh, his avid supporter. He became my my hero, my first hero. And I wanted to do. I wanted to be like James Brown. And the other thing was his dancing was incredible. Uh, everyone wanted to be James Brown around my neighborhood when we all were monitored as the best dancers and who could turn the party out and create a circle around them. You know that guy inside the circle, everyone watching was doing James Brown moves. Mm. And 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 uh, so that's where we get the Saturday Night Fever sort of like movie where John Travolta is at the club and then yeah. everybody's dancing but then he starts doing some incredible moves and people stop dancing and they move back and they create a circle around him and then somebody else comes in the circle and they do competition yeah the winner of that competition is the hero and he gets the girl right <laughs> right so that sort of thing happened at the parties in 69 70 71 when we were teenagers around 72 before disco really came in, James Brown sound, that beat I'm saying, was predominant and the Motown sound was on its way out, sort of. So all the bands started gearing up to this James Brown signature and that four by four time signature when we're talking drums mm -hmm. and the actual beats that were predominantly, you know, in the hood and, the, and, the, and what we played at the pop parties and really, on the radio as, as well, uh, you know, and I remember these songs, these early funk songs were the, the inspiration to hip hop and break dance. And like I said, in that circle, cats in that circle were trying to be James Brown. We were called B-Boys because we danced to the breaks of yeah. the songs. And the most important part of a song, if you're at a party in a club, is the in break. a dance, is the break. When it breaks down to the drums, again, that drum beat, that James Brown drum beat, when you can hear that, that's when you do your best moves. That's when you go down to the floor and do splits and you, know, you create that circle of people around you. And those people inside the circle were B-boys. Right. We, and originally they were called Break Boys, and then it got break shortened boys. to Beat yes. Boys. Bronx Boys, Break Bronx Boys. Bronx Boys. Beat Boys. Beat Boys, mm -hmm. okay. Um, now, at what point did you start, uh, did you meet Cool Herc? Uh, great, great name in the early, early days of hip hop, like I was talking about James Brown. All right, here comes this DJ who moves to the South Bronx from, uh, well, let's say the Bronx from Jamaica. Uh, Jamaica. So he's bringing in this whole new sound, uh, ragamuffin toasting, the Jamaica uh, sound, reggae. But his favorite artist was James Brown. Mm -hmm. So he became a connoisseur of his music as a DJ playing this James Brown sound music, Motown sound, soul music that we grew up on in the 60s. When disco started to come out and you got you have the monotonous uh, European sound, a thump, 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 mm, 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 thump, 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 almost back to the Motown sound, but no, it's with the drum beat. It's with the bass drum. Do, 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 do. It's not syncopated and funky as James Brown, so we really didn't relate to it. So where Cool Hurt comes in, he became the catalyst, the DJ, to play this is what we call Old school music in the 70s, the 71, 72, 3, 4, around those years where disco came up, village people, YMCA, Donna Summer, all that stuff was predominantly on the radio. Cool Herc went back to the playlist that I grew up on. James Brown, Motown Sound, uh, all the funk songs, songs that came out in the 70s as well. Because okay. there still was some Funketeers playing this syncopated beat like Joe Quarterman and, 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 and um, <clears throat> people like Dennis Coffey 
and with Scorpio, that song, uh, many, many hits came out. Even, even the, the music of Sly Stone was kind of like really, really funky to yeah. us. You know, that sing a simple song, songs like that. Uh, stand, uh, everyday people, you know, all those hits were R&B soul songs. Cool Herc would play in the world of disco and not play the songs that were in the radio. So he became the catalyst to this whole ideology that we were rebels in disco. Yeah, we love the DJ, we love music, we love the dance, but we grew up on this funky, funky, funky stuff that's not really thump, 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 thump. Mm -hmm. And so we became music researchers. I would go to your mom's house, his mom's your auntie house, and we sit up all day just going through the music collection, playing records and records. But these records, if it had that funky break, I was telling you about one, two, three, four, hit it. If it had anything similar to that, that was what we would call our break song, our b-boy song. We take it and snatch it from your mom and say, oh, let me have it, and give it to the DJ, yo, DJ, play this. Then we break to it. That was our thing. When you first started rapping, mm -hmm. were there other rappers already? Um, a few. Of, um, there were a few before me. You see, you have to understand when you say rap, there were rappers rapping back in the 1920s. I mean, yeah. you know. But rappers as what we know when, being as, rappers as, today. As compared to hip hop. And see, the whole thing, and that's a controversial issue. I looked on Wikipedia the other day, they have, you know, other guys doing that. There's nowhere. There's no Curtis Blow in the house. But um, I remember, you know, well, you have to think disco because there was two sides to the coin. You have the hip hoppers, or we call them ghetto DJs, or you know this this hardcore underground sound. It wasn't the disco on the radio played, but it was more underground so a sound. And then you had the real street DJs, disco DJs that were doing their thing, the number one DJs uh, for, I mean, I'm talking about the crowd that would, you know, work all week. And then on the weekends, you pay your five, ten dollars downtown at the at the club, the disco. They actually pay five, ten dollars to get in. There's a big disco ball, the mirror strobe lights, everybody has on suits and ties and silk dresses and you dance your night away. That's a club, but the DJ there was still was sort of like a street DJ uh, playing obscure music, but playing disco. So you had sort of like two sides of the coin and two different markets. So I come out of both of those markets, that disco DJ market, when you talk about DJs like Pete DJ Jones, Flowers Maboya Plummer, uh, 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 then you have uh, the disco twins and DJ Hollywood, uh, Love Buck Starsky, Eddie Chiba, Reggie Wells, all of those cats came out of the disco era, but they were still doing sort of like a hip hop sounding, rapping, orientating the crowd because the MC, master of ceremonies, that's the guy on the mic making the announcements. When they first started out, they were just making simple announcements at the clubs. Like, yo, Joey, your mom's outside, it's 10 o'clock, you go <laughs> Yo, Sam, your car's getting towed, you know. And, and, and the MC's master ceremony was a dime a dozen. The DJ was the focal point. Mm -hmm. He was the one that had the power. He hired and fired the MC's. He controlled the music. That was the main thing was the music. Yeah. Everybody was going out for the music, you know, to hear your favorite jams. Uh, he controlled the lights, the ambiance of the crowd. He controlled the tempo of the music, you know. So, so he was the focal point, and, and the MCs, you know, were dime a dozen. We were just hired to set up the equipment, <laughs> bring it to the club, right. and at the end of the night, we'd break the equipment down and take it back to the house. And the DJ let us get in free for this. Yeah. We didn't have to pay, and we could make announcements sometimes and talk to the girls. Yeah. And that's all we wanted to do, you know. So we were a dime a dozen, but there was a changing of the guard. Um, um, you know, first they were making announcements. So when you had this turntablism or evolution of the, of the DJ where Grandmaster Flash came in and took the break that was so very important, and, but only lasted for 10, 15 seconds, he extended the break by taking two of the same records and playing just that break. 
before it ended and went to the whack part, we call it the whack part, you know, the singing, he played the break again, just from the beginning of the break. So you just heard the break extended. He, he could take that 10 seconds and extend it to three, four minutes. And Pete DJ Jones, rest in peace, he said, man, you could listen to the same beat all day in the park, <laughs> right. you know? And so that became ev the evolution that gave the MC an opportunity to do more than just make announcements. Uh, we okay. became, you know, entertainers. We had to tell jokes. We had to tell stories. We became rhythmic rappers. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, thank you, Grandmaster Flash. Um, uh, uh, but that's the evolution. And, and, and so, you know, the changing of the guard happened again when the rap record came out. Because uh, before I said the DJ was the focal point and the boss. But when the rap record started, that was the vocalist. We became entertainers. They were eyes were fo We went out front instead of making announcements in the back. You know, we went out front as entertainers. Throw your hands in the air, scream. And the crowd response was the big, a big, big, big portion of that because it gave us the, the connection and the spiritualness like coming from the church. Amen. <laughs> so, you know, that whole connection between, uh, between the MC and the crowd became one of a special uh, uh, entity because of the power that we possess to take the audience to the next level. I want to shout out. Uh, the tour I'm going in, the Auto Rap Festival is happening in mm -hmm. July and August with uh, Public Enemy and Ice T and Naughty by Nature, Mob Deep and MC Light, Sugar Hill Gang, Melly Mel and myself. It's just going to be a great, great, great um, tour, a great, great festival, uh, just being together with the old school again, a lot of the cats. The Ice T and I have, haven't, have never toured together. Mm -hmm. We've done one or two shows together, but a series of 10, so we'll be coming around your city. Look out for us, Art of Rap Festival that's happening. And I do have a new organization. I'm trying to unite all of the hip hop churches around the world. Mm. And it's called hiphopchurchglobal.com. You can go to that website. It's a, just a hub of information. Hip hop churches, gospel churches, any kind of churches. You have Bibles, you have app, ASCAP, you have you know, Harry Fox Agency, you know, from prayer, you can get a free Bible there, from prayer to production, I, I like to say. So we're out to help anyone, you know, with anything uh, at any time. So that's hiphopchurchglobal.com. You'll see a series of help organizations. Look, I work with them on Mad. Mm -hmm. Good guys. Mm -hmm. Good heart. Good guys give you the shirt off their back. Is it, is it ironic? Is it, is it a coincidence that they both, most of their friends are white and got white wives? They like white women? I, I mean. Then they develop envy because they go home. They get out the car with, they, with, with, with their friend, with their other partner, and he listening to your music. They walk in the house, they girl listening to your music. They go downstairs, the kids doing a dance to your music. Now they are hypnotized with hatred. 